Over on Mastodon, Robin Laws mentioned that he had a new book published. If you're not familiar with Robin Laws, he's a game designer that's been designing RPGs since the 90s. He's, he's credited on many, many different kinds of RPGs for many different systems. Everything from trad, what they call trad F20, which is essentially traditional D20-based fantasy RPGs. He's written for like the Dungeon Master's Guide 2 for the fourth edition version of D&D. But he's also written, he was the designer for Gumshoe, the Gumshoe system for investigation. He's done a lot of stuff with like Cthulhu-based adventures. He's been deeply involved involved in in tabletop RPG design for many decades. Super smart guy. He has a few books in general that I think are really good. The probably the number one book that I recommend to his is called Hamlet's Hit Points. And Hamlet's Hit Points really hammered into me the whole idea of upward and downward beats. The idea that people and players will resonate when good things happen and bad things happen and good things happen and bad things happen. So you don't want to necessarily just have like all bad things happen or all good things happen. Really change the way that I think about RPGs. He also wrote Robin's Laws of Good Game Mastering which is a good way of like thinking about the different kinds of things that different players come to your table with and how you can sort of tie into those hooks to, to, to make their kind of games interesting. And now he's done it for adventure, des- adventure scenarios themselves in a book called The Adventure Crucible, Building Stronger Scenarios for Any RPG. You can buy this on Drive-Thru RPG for eight bucks. There is a link in the show notes to pick up the book. And I really liked it. I, 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 I picked it up and I really enjoyed it. The book itself is pretty short. It's a 54-page PDF. He refers to it as a chat book. This idea that like, hey, here's this really focused thing that we're going to talk about. The writing is really good and tight and gets the point across. I, I read it like in two nights and really enjoyed it and, and thought it was very useful. And the focus of this book is that there are specific types of adventure scenarios for traditional fantasy role-playing games that we commonly hit. And those five types are the dungeon, the mystery, the chain of fights, survival, and intrigue. And he describes each of these different kinds of adventure scenarios by what are the criteria that that make it such. The, The dungeon is you're crawling through a dungeon, fighting monsters, going from room to room, picking up treasure and doing that sort of thing. The mystery is an event occurred and the character's goal is to figure out what happened during that event. They don't know what they they don't know. They may have come in at the end of the event. And they're trying to backtrack to learn what the stages of that event were. The chain of fights, as you imagine, is you're fighting a whole series of battles, either in multiple rooms or like waves of combatants from one room to another. Survival is the idea that something is either chasing you, you either have to run from it or avoid it, or you have to find a way to kind of you know, secure an area and battle against it. And then intrigue is you're kind of, you're building up your reputation as you are interacting with different sorts of factions and things like that. Now, the thing that the book, and then he talks on a couple of other ones, like the picture, the picturesque and the drama, the picturesque is the, we explore places just to see them. Like it's fun to kind of go around and just witness, witness the world as you sort of go there. And then drama is the sort of, in many cases, inner character drama that can occur between characters and between characters and NPCs that can kind of build up. For each of these different designs, and he talks about the core activity. The core activity is like, hey, the system that you're playing usually tells you who the characters are and what they're doing in the world. And he brings up that if a game ever says something like, in this game, you can do anything, then you should pull away. What's funny about that is GURPS says that, and GURPS is a game that he worked on. Fate also kind of says that, you know, but the individual scenarios for fate don't say that. So I think I'm not sure that, you know, like I think I think that's a higher level rule rather than a lower level rule. But generally, his point is that a role playing game should tell you up front. Here's who the characters are and here's the kind of things that they can do. And uh, one thing that I've caught myself doing is I look at the character sheet for a game very early on. If I want to know what a game is like, I can usually dissect it by looking at a character sheet. And something that my wife actually got me, she, she, she brought this up and I was like, that's really, I never thought of it that way, was that when you look at things like the lists of skills, I always like looked at them as like, whenever I see a game that's got like 39 skills or 40 or 50 skills, I'm always like, you know, just give me the four attributes. Like, why don't we just roll ability checks? Like the skills, I, I looked at this when I was looking at a Call of Cthulhu game, a recent Call of Cthulhu game. And I was like, there's so many skills, but I'm like, they're all percentage based. And the percentages are like tiny little increments of percentages, right? It's like 3% different. And I was like, you know, why are we nitpicking about 3% different? It fills half the character sheet. And her point was reading those skills tells you what you can do and tells you what this game is about. And I was like, that's a really good point that that's why there's all these skills. These are all the different things you can do. And that's the instructions, right? And the, the percentages that you roll aren't really that important. 
those things are the things that are telling you what you could do. This is why, like, you, when you change your aspects in fate. So I thought that, that whenever I'm looking at a character sheet, it really tells me that. And I, and I get that idea here. So this, this idea of like, what's the core activity of the game that you're picking up? What's its design? Shadow Dark RPG, which I'm running in an hour, very clearly shows you what, what those things are. So the scenario structures, dungeon, the mystery, the chain of fights, the survival and intrigue. And then we talked a little bit about picturesque and drama. And then for each of these, he talks about specific aspects of these that are worth considering as a GM. That, you know, when you, what's the premise that goes behind this? And do you have buy-in from the players to follow that premise? No one cares about a mystery if no one cares about what happened. Right? If your characters don't care what happened, they're not going to engage in the mystery. If they're not interested in going into a dungeon and battling things, they're not going to be there. So what's the premise? And, and, and how do you ensure that the, the players and their characters have accepted that premise? What are the emotional stakes? What draws them? Cutting to the fun. How can you get right to the most interesting part of this and, and kind of scale? Skip stuff. And I, I talked about this in when I was talking about my Shadow Dark RPG is that I jump instead of having like you go to a bar, somebody comes by and says, hey, you look like adventurers that are wanting to have a job. We have my, my a friend of ours got kidnapped by bandits and he's at this old tower. If there's only one path, skip it. And instead, start them at the tower. You're at the tower. You got here because this guy hired you to go rescue this guy. Here's the scenario. You already accepted it, and you're at the tower. And now your choice is how do you want to get into the tower? Jump to that first interesting choice. Like, if you don't have choices, narrate it and skip it and get ahead and get to the part where the choices start to show up. What are the obstacles? What are the things in this particular scenario that grab, that, that are going to challenge the actual characters? You know, and lots of talk about that. Where are the turning points? So and you know, we're just going to look through dungeons. We're not going to go through all of them in, in this whole book. And if you haven't figured out, my argument is you should go buy this book. This book is really, really good. So what's the premise acceptance for a dungeon? You know, hey, if you're playing this, you, you said you would do it. What are the emotional stakes? What draws you in to make sure that you want to go there? The MacGuffin in the dungeon. Hey, we want you to go collect. There's an old evil idol in the bottom. It's worth a lot of money. And it's also dangerous if it falls in the wrong hands. Why don't you go down and get it? That way, both greedy players who, who want the money, they can go down to get it. And players who are doing right, right from wrong will want to go get it so that it doesn't fall into evil hands. You know, that can work. Cutting to the fun. How do you jump ahead? Obstacles. What are the obstacles that you can put in front of the players so that they, so that they, want, to, that, that they want to find it? There's a lot of typical obstacles. Escalation. How do you increase it? Like what, what makes it get harder as you go? Resolution. What's the really, what's the fun at the end? Now, one of the things that, and then he talks about mysteries and how mysteries work the same way. And he talks about this whole, this whole thing. Now, one of the things that he talks about in this is hybrid structures. And this is the thing that first got me when I was reading it is I was like, I don't often run just one of those scenarios. I usually mix in some, for example, when I run dungeons, they also have a mystery element to them. It's not usually that you're trying to dissect an event that occurred, but I use secrets and clues as a way for the players and the characters to learn more about the dungeon that they're in, the inhabitants of the dungeon, the plots that are going on there. There's mystery elements to it. So I, I take like these ideas, these 10 secrets and clues, and I sort of weave them into the dungeon when I'm running it, but I still love dungeons as initial structure. Same way with like waves of combatants or that whole idea of fighting, fighting a series of battles. A lot of times I will use that as the final battle in in a session or in a dungeon. They go to a big room. There's your big boss. A bunch of minions attack. You kill the minions. A couple of big lieutenants come. You kill the lieutenants and then you finally get to fight the boss. Those waves of combatants. Survival could also go in there. Intrigue can also go in there. So these different structures that he has for these adventures, a lot of times I bring them together. He doesn't talk a lot about building these hybrid structures other than to say like, you can do so, but it's going to be harder to do the prep. I actually don't find it to be harder to do the prep for a hybrid structure. I think it's actually pretty easy to drop that stuff in. And in the meantime, it builds, in my opinion, a much richer adventure overall. So I thought it could have been, there could have been a little bit more time spent on the hybrid structures. Connect the obstacles together. Make sure none of our fun ruiners and so he has a table in here about fun ruiners. And this is something I think we can really get into, which when you have an adventure structure that you choose, what are the common pitfalls of using that adventure structure? How can the fun be broken when you're doing that adventure structure? He, call, he talks about a few of them in here, but I actually think that there are probably more. What's the point of escalation and how do you do your resolution? But the fun ruiner is an example of the dungeon. You know, So we have the dungeon here and the fun ruiners for a dungeon are areas that can't be entered or areas that provide only one choice of where to go next. For me, one of the fun ruiners of a dungeon, which I got from Robin Law, 
boss is too many downward beats that dungeons are only things that are just constantly you're getting shot with spears and stabbed and skeletons attack you and then specters drain your life and you know can't rest and you can't get out and you know it's just down or down or down or down downer and so the fun ruiner for me is when it's too many downs and instead you need to have these upward beats that's something that i think is really interesting but you know just even the idea of thinking about your games this way i think is really 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 useful so excellent excellent book i really enjoy this book adventure crucible building stronger scenarios for any rpg by robin laws link is in the show notes eight dollars really good read I, I really enjoyed it one thing that i thought was interesting about this something that i had thought about with this i had gotten a patreon question recently who said like who do you really who do you follow and admire like in social media that you really like like whether it's youtube videos or whether it's like you know i don't i'm not on twitter anymore but like a mastodon or other social networks and one thing that i realized is that like I am not inspired by the kind of material that people put up on social media. I, I, I can get inspired by blog articles and podcasts and sometimes YouTube videos, but not, not a lot. The people who are chasing the algorithm on YouTube, I generally don't get anything from those. And social, general social media posts, I, I hardly get anything from. Books like this, I get a lot from. And the stuff that really inspires me as both a GM and as a designer myself are reading other people's work in books like this. And it's worth eight bucks. Even though it's 54 pages and it's a very quick read, the ideas that you get get from this enrich me they make me think about the game differently and when i read other systems i i think about the game differently when i think about lore and i think about other worlds and i think about other scenarios and other games and how those all work that all kind of grows in and that like boy if we could my you know rant, old man rant for a quick second but my old man rant and this is speaking to me because i do this all the time I'm like oh i should check mastodon i should read my comments on facebook i should go read a book Instead, like go pick up these books and read them because there's so much good information and so much inspiration that comes from these. And that's the, the people that wrote them when they're edited, when they've gone through testing, when they've seen it, the kind of the, the refined thought that we get from these books are so much better than sort of the raw information that's usually like wrapped up in drama and wrapped up in other stuff that we get on other social media sites that books, man, read books. So one of the things that came out for me when I was reading Adventure Crucible, Building Stronger RP Building Stronger Scenarios for RPGs by Robin Laws, excellent, excellent book, was some of the adventure models that I use that are different than those common models of adventure, mystery, intrigue, wave of battles, survival, that I have different models that I use. And I've talked about some of these models before. An example is like the Seven Samurai model, which is sort of a wave of combatants slash survival model. But it's the idea like that it's taken directly from Seven Samurai. A group of villagers or uh, you know have hired the adventurers to protect their village from an oncoming un oncoming onslaught. And the neat thing about it is it's not just one scenario type. The players get to decide how they want to engage. Do they want to defend the village? Do they want to go attack the other people before they defend the village? Do they want to do some reconnoitering? Do they want to recon and see? like well who are these bad guys and what's going on with them and how many are they do they want to go find a powerful artifact that can help them there's so many different avenues that an adventure scenario like this can go that still comes from this really simple premise that a bunch of villagers are being attacked by a bunch of bandits and they need the protection of the characters who the villagers are who the bandits are what the village is like what the base of the bandits are like all of those things can change but that core idea can can work really well and a lot of these kinds of scenario types are the, the scenario that I put in the Lazy DM's Companion, so, right? So in the, in the latter third of the Lazy DM's Companion, I have these sort of adventure scenarios. And so we have like wars, like wh when you're running a war, when you're running a war, what are some of the different ways that you can have your wartime scenario work out? And I have one page about building like characters in war. And a lot of times GMs run to, oh, I need a subsystem so that the players can actually play different groups in the war. It's like, no, stick to the characters. They just have different types of missions that they go on. They have different things that they do that affect the war. The traitor, you know, this is taken right out of Heart of Darkness by Campbell or Apocalypse Now. This idea that the characters are brought on because there's a traitor that's out there, but the traitor is in a very dangerous land. You have to go across the land. Somebody's protecting the traitor. You're going to have to make your way all the way there through this land in order to find 
find this 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 central bad guy and take them out or or not right and you can change all kinds of different things so who who's the traitor who's the patron what's the motivation to go after the traitor what landscape do they have to go through to find the traitor who's protecting the traitor or who's in between you and the traitor and then where's the traitor hiding right all of those different aspects that we have in, the, in that version the hunger is based on jaws there's a big monster that's out there that's eating people right where what is the creature that's eating people what makes this creature unique among all of its variants that could be out there where does it reside who's protecting it right so you have minions that you can fight what drives the creature to do what it's doing and who else is hunting the creature all of these different variables that can exist vengeance for hire right this is your john wick that you know somebody hired you in order to go take care of bad guys right who are the patrons who uh, you know who uh, who is the villain that you're hunting? What crime did they commit? Who's protecting the villain? Where does the villain hide? And what complications might occur? That's a common scenario that I like. Protect the village of Seven Samurai. This is the one I was talking about before. Who are the villagers? What are the features of the village? What's the villager's secret? Who are the marauders that are attacking the village? And where do the marauders lair? The Keep is based on a movie called The Keep, which is based on a book called The Keep, which is about a prison that has been built that is shattering and an entity inside the prison is breaking free. There are some groups that might want to break the creature out. There's some groups that might want to break it out in order to kill it. So there's all these sort of complications, but it's all from the central idea that there is a prison, a cell, a keep that is holding back a very powerful creature. I have an adventure in Ruins of the Grender Root based on this. Invaders. You know, this is your very typical aliens. You're getting attacked by a bunch of different things. This kind of gets into the survival waves of horror aspect. The hunt for the relic, right? Straightforward Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're going to hunt to go find a thing. It's hidden in a certain place. There's definitely things that are protecting it, both environmental issues, but also monsters. And there are rivals that are going after it. That's that sort of complication. And then the heist is very common. Who's the target? What's the location? Who's protecting it? What do you have to get through? Who's the final guard and what complications exist? So those are all like examples of adventure models that I use that I think are a mixture of the different ones that Robin Laws has. I think it's really useful to read both of these. I think you should buy both books, frankly. I think it's really useful to read both of these because you'll get an idea of all these different structures. But to me, kind of defining them down to like dungeon and mystery and intrigue and waves of combatants and whatever the fifth one is, survival, that it's actually the really interesting adventures are where those intersect. And I think like that, that's what I got really excited for when I wrote these styles of adventure scenarios where you can see the variables that can exist so that you can make thousands of different types of specific adventures built on these overall themes that all include secrets and clues, potentially waves of combatants, delving into a dungeon, mysteries that are occurring, all this kind of stuff that you can have in there. So... You know, I think it's worth thinking about, and you might have your own, but it, it takes a little bit of careful work to understand what kind of scenario works well, because a key to all of these scenarios is choice, which is something Robin Laws talks about in that book. Making sure that you're always giving the opportunities for choice, that you are setting up situations and letting the characters navigate them. You don't know the one path they're going to take. You're not just stepping them through from one thing to the next. They're making valuable choices in these things. And all of these scenarios that I have, the characters have choices about how they're going to defend against what they're going to do, how they're going to go in there, where they're going to go. There's all these different sort of scenarios that are going on, different ways that they can come in with a choice. So I think it's a really useful style thinking about that so i definitely recommend robin laws's book and if you want to see the scenarios that i really hang on to that i think are really useful for running them the lazy dm's companion has those scenarios in it if you enjoyed this show once again please consider becoming a patron of sly flourish you get access to all kinds of things like uncovered secrets volume one and two dedicated discord server the patreon q a lots of different stuff you get for being a patron of sly flourish you can also pick up my books at the sly flourish bookstore but the best way to keep in touch with all of the different things i do the articles i write the tips i give out the videos i produce is to be is to subscribe to the sly flourish newsletter it's absolutely free to sign up you get a free adventure generator pdf and you get a weekly rpg related article which includes links to all of my other videos and all the other stuff that i do every week on tuesdays thank you all very much have a great day and get out there and play an rpg